Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Daisy Hernandez to discuss The Kissing Bug, a true story of a family, an insect, and a nation's neglect of a deadly disease, published by our friends at Tin House. Daisy Hernandez is a former reporter for the New York Times and has been writing about the intersections of race, immigration, class, and sexuality for almost two decades. She has written for National Geographic, NPR's All Things Considered and Code Switch, The Atlantic, Slate, and Guernica. And she's the former editor of Color Lines, a news magazine on race and politics. Daisy is the author of the award-winning memoir, A Cup of Water Under My Bed, and co-editor of Colonize This, Young Women of Color on Today's Feminism. She's an associate professor at Miami University in Ohio. To moderate tonight's conversation, we're joined by Chris Newby. Chris is an award-winning science technology writer and the senior producer of the Lyme disease documentary, Under Our Skin, which premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival and was a 2010 Oscar semifinalist. Her book, Bitten, won a 2019 Silver Nautilus Book Award in Journalism and Investigative Reporting and the Top 2020 International Book Award for Narrative Nonfiction. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. And you can order your copy of The Kissing Bug from Books and Books below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for having Hello. us. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Books and Books. Well, Daisy, <laughs> I was I was so excited to meet you. You sent me an advanced copy of the book about a year ago, I guess, and I just so enjoyed it. And so good to see you in virtual in person. Um, I feel an affinity affinity for you because both our books uh, are part memoir and part med medical history, which is a difficult thing to do. First of all, writing about your own life, your relatives. And then uh, researching in the medical world, which is double black diamond technical, you want to make sure you get it right. Uh, and the other thing I enjoyed about your book is uh, it shares some common themes with mine, and that is blood sucking bugs. Uh, your, in your case, it's kissing bugs. In my case, it's uh, fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes, and how they're used in the bioweapons program. Uh, and then about how a major medical illness can destroy families, break up marriages, financially send people into financial ruins, uh, strain relationships. And then uh, a, a theme that I feel near and dear about is the injustice in our current medical system. And I, I can't wait to go deeper into that. So uh, first of all, not many people in the United States know what kissing bugs are. So could you talk about what they are? and the disease that they spread. So let's start it off. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for doing this with me tonight because I am such a big, big fan of your book and absolutely felt so much affinity. It is such a challenge to write, as you were saying, memoir and medical history and um, and also like the political and social context and commentary, right? That's necessary, I think. So um, yeah, I actually think I, I shared on, on Facebook or Twitters, I shared somewhere, if you had not titled your book Bitten, I might have titled mine. <laughs> I love your the title. <laughs> um, and so kissing bugs, yes, are actually triatomine insects. There's There are more than 100 species, actually. Um, but in South America, Central America, and Mexico, there's about five that are considered to be dangerous in the sense that they, those five most easily and most often transmit uh, the parasite Trypanosoma cruzi, which is what uh, leads to the kissing bug disease or its technical term or actual name is Chagas disease. 
Something that's a little bit unusual about these insects is that we usually consider the bite or having been bitten with the transmission of a microbe, right? Whether it's a parasite or um, a virus, et cetera, or bacteria. In this case, actually, these insects um, uh, bite and the parasitic materials actually in their fecal matter. So they, uh, you know, bite you and then at some point defecate. Um, and that material can get into the bite wound. They also, um, you know, go towards the face. So that material can be introduced by in your, you know, around your eye or your mouth or your nose. Um, they attack people at night. These insects do not like the daylight. They're definitely vampire tendencies. So, um, so they'll wait during the day. And, and a lot of times they're found in rural homes um, in Latin America where there will be crevices because these are kind of like adobe type of constructions. So there's crevices where they can hide out. They'll also happily hide out under the bed uh, and wait. And they're basically waiting for people to come home to go to sleep. Um, in order to then start that process of attacking. Um, and yeah, and there, there's so much more that I could say, but, uh, but that's like the gist of the, the insects themselves. And apologies to anyone who showed up, but it is called the kissing bug, so you knew you were gonna hear it. And it's, <laughs> and it's not a romantic story. <laughs> it's not a romantic story, no, yeah. Are there kissing bugs in the United States? I don't know that. Yeah, thank you for asking me because I forgot to say that. So we do, we have a number of species in the U.S., mostly in the south, um, in the southern U.S., uh, in Texas, all over California, actually, including the Bay Area, where I think you are at, um, and also the southwest as well. And they can transmit, too. We don't have documented, we don't have high numbers of documented cases. The CDC, at this point, um, only acknowledges that there's a fewer than a hundred people who have sort of quote unquote like homegrown shagas. That's my word, not the CDC's word. Um, it, you know, it could be for a number of reasons that we don't have more cases, um, including the insects themselves. There, there was a, a, some studies done that showed, uh, one study in particular that showed the insects in the U US were not transmitting at as high rates uh, of the parasite. Um, but we also have, you know, different housing construction here. Uh, you end up with some pests and you can run over to your local store or hop online and order like pesticides. Um, all of that said, it is difficult um, to, it can be difficult to test. Uh, the CDC, for example, requires um, two out of three positive tests before it's willing to consider you as someone who actually has this disease. Um, Texas has the Texas Chagas Task Force. Uh, I can put that in the chat box maybe later at some point, but they do have a task force and there's a wonderful um, guide to the kissing bug actually that was produced by Texas A&M University. They've been doing a lot of studies in Texas because Texas actually has about 11 species of this insect. Two of them are the ones that are very active in transmitting the parasite, but um, Part of what I write about in the book is how just how shockingly easy it was to go out and go out in Texas, not like to really remote areas, but just in College Station. And mm -hmm. if you're looking for kissing bugs, you will find them. And of course, if you talk to people from Texas, they're like, these bugs are everywhere. Um, they had a pretty amazing citizen scientist program at Texas A&M where more than 2000 people sent the insects that they found around their home um, and found a pretty high rate of infection among them, among those insects. Yeah, and that's a thing we've seen with COVID and Lyme disease and tick-borne diseases. It seems to be there's a real lag in the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, uh, keeping track of the spread of a disease. And so the people on the front edge suffer, I think. Yeah, absolutely. What, what are the symptoms early and late how do you know if you have Chagas disease? Because you you won't know you had a bite. Does the bite leave a, a mark or anything? It usually will produce some kind of skin reaction, but this is what is tricky about Chagas disease is that um, you don't necessarily notice it because it might just be like any other bug bite, you know? It doesn't necessarily have a distinct distinctive feature in terms of the bite itself. Um, if the material is introduced into the eye, you will get a swelling of an eyelid, 
but it's also not something that's so different. You might think that it's an eye problem. I actually interviewed someone who uh, spent quite a bit of time tracking down doctors in terms of her eyesight, thinking that it was something that was happening with the eye. Not, not, it took her a while to realize that it was actually a bug bite that had produced that. And the, the symptoms themselves are really vague in that acute stage, which is the first two months. It can, it can be like you have the flu, you know, there's fatigue, there might be fever. Some people don't have any reactions, um, but it's, it, the symptoms are not uh, super alarming, are not super definitive. Um, the majority of people who are being infected, this disease is, you know, predominantly found in South America, Central America, and Mexico in rural areas. So these are not communities that have uh, tons of resources. They don't have doctors at their disposals. So they're not like super, you know, sometimes I feel like here in the U.S., like, you know, if I stub my toe, that's like super monitored, you know? Um, but, you know, so you, you don't have a concierge doctor? <laughs> exactly. No concierge doctors for these folks, or for myself, actually. But, um, but yeah, but the, the symptoms are not, you know, super alarming, which is part of what's challenging because in the, then after those like two months, you're in the chronic stage of the disease. And, you know, the majority of people will actually live uh, and die with this parasite and not have medical complications. But what, about one in three people do go on to develop uh, usually cardiac complications. And that can happen uh, the following year. It can happen 10 years later, even 30 years later. So the parasite can be very dormant in terms of symptoms. Um, but it can eventually lead to... Um, to all sorts of cardiac abnormalities. So irregular heartbeats, um, eventually the need for a defibrillator or pacemaker. Mm -hmm. One person who I interviewed for the book uh, needed a heart transplant um, because the parasite is just so severely attacking the heart muscle in so many different ways. And for my auntie, she was in a smaller group where the parasite attacks the gastrointestinal system. So it goes after that large intestine, it goes after the esophagus, um, it can dilate the large intestine so that uh, a person looks like they're pregnant because their intestine has just grown to that size in their body. So, um, yeah, in her case, she needed multiple surgeries uh, in order to stay alive, essentially, at that point. Wow. Wow. And um, you've often said uh, you're, the story chose you rather than you choosing the story. So could you elaborate on that? Because that's how I felt, too. Uh, you know, 20 years ago when I was bitten by a tick, I never thought I'd become an expert on ticks, but sometimes yeah. you can't walk away. So what happened in your life to make you take on this very ambitious story? Yeah, yeah, I never expected to write this book. Um, like with my memoir, A Cup of Water Under My Bed, I knew I was writing that book. Like I knew I had to make sense of like coming of age in this immigrant family and being queer. Like I knew I needed to do that. But this book, I feel like, definitely um, picked me. I think for me, it was, uh, you know, so my I grew up knowing about this disease because my auntie was diagnosed in New York City, which was really unusual, actually. Um, and, and so I grew up with her having this diagnosis, her being in and out of hospitals over the years. Uh, and I never believed that she would actually lose her life to this disease because you kind of, I don't want to say you get used to the chronic stage, but you it becomes this sort of like part of your life. Like you might be in the hospital this month. You might not. You know, it's just it's, it's I, her it's like, identity. It's her identity. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it becomes your identity. And I think for us, it was very much a family identity because we were all there with her. And so there were some years that were great and she was traveling and life was good. And then there were some years that she was in the hospital for two months. And so to me, it was incredibly shocking when, when she did lose her life to this disease. And I actually found myself, actually, because we're at Books and Books, I was just a few minutes away from Books and Books. And I was writing fiction. I was writing a short story uh, from a child's perspective about a, a mother figure who has this disease. And it just really hit me that I knew so little actually about the disease itself. So I started reading a little bit. And then of course, you know, you go down the rabbit hole that you're familiar with of, you know, research leading to more research. I think for me, it was, I, we had, I had grown up thinking that it was, um, that it was very rare. It was th that, you know, my auntie was the only person I knew with this disease. We had never met another family with it. And so to find out that there are, um, 
you know, it's about 6 million people in Latin America with this disease, that there are 300,000 people in the United States uh, with this disease. And, and those 300,000 people, um, these are estimates of people in the Latinx community. So people who probably were infected in Latin America and who are here and have this disease, or who may have had it transmitted um, during pregnancy in the sense that similar to the Zika virus, this parasite can also pass from mother to child as well, which I didn't know when my auntie was alive. She didn't have children of her own. And so we just, we absolutely just didn't, didn't know. So that was really shocking to me that there would be that many Latinx immigrant families who had um, were facing this disease and and that I didn't know any of them had, had never heard of them had no idea and so I absolutely feel like it picked the book picked me because I wanted to know who they were what their experiences were and I initially thought that it might be an essay or an article uh, of some kind but you know, similar to what you were saying uh, of earlier, of uh, I think when we were before the, the before we started this, um, the sort of the bio weapon part of Lyme disease, right? Uh, not knowing that part, for me it was also like then going into this medical history and realizing like, whoa, this is there's so much here that I don't know and that I feel like very much needs to be documented, should be known uh, in its totality. So um, so I end up writing about medical, ex one particular medical experiment that was carried out, but also writing about some of the doctors that have been like, have become advocates for their patients because, um, you know, they, they're just faced with really uh, heart-wrenching decisions as doctors. So like all of that just, yeah, the book grew and grew and grew um, over time, yeah. Yeah. and. Uh one thing that I identified with was your the shock of finding out these um, un, these unethical medical experiments uh, on people of color. So, in my book, uh, I unearthed news that in 1962, the U.S. military dropped infected ticks on Cuban sugar workers as part of payback uh, for Bay of Pigs fiasco, and then. Uh, the bioweapons program also did experiments um, unconsenting on poor black communities in Georgia and in, um, in Florida. So uh, I found it shocking, but, and you also unearthed similar, uh, a similar experiment. Uh, so could you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. And Chris, I'm sure you've had the same feeling that I've had during COVID when people talk about um, the vaccine hesitancy in the black community you know, one of the things that I tell people is, you know, many of us think about Tuskegee because we know about that, but we, there are so many other experiments that have been carried out that we don't, many of us don't know about, but communities know about it. You know, it's hard for me to imagine that, you know, word of mouth did not get out in some way. And I think about that with the experiment that I also found, found out about, which took place in Texas in 1940. Um, a researcher was sent from the Public Health Service and, and basically was sent to find out if there were cases of Chagas disease and or the kissing bug disease and he could not find any but they knew that they that they knew that the insects were in Texas they they were following everything that, that was coming out of Brazil where the disease was initially discovered in 1909 so this is like now 30 years later and um, and so he was not finding it. He was not finding people who were infected. So he went to the Austin State Hospital, which was a psychiatric hospital. Um, by 1940, a majority of patients there were being treated for schizophren schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Um, and what he did was he took insects um, from Texas uh, and used them to intentionally infect uh, at least one young black man who was in his early 20s, who was a patient from that hospital. Uh, the correspondence suggests that there were more patients. I couldn't find more records of that. Um, but you know, just even one experiment on one person is incredibly horrific. Um, and and what he found out was, you know, he, basically very similar to Tuskegee, where uh, you have these researchers monitoring the progression of the disease. Um, in, in, the, in, in the person that they're experimenting on, he basically tracked, you know, okay, two weeks after purposefully infecting this young black man, um, you know, he did have reactions, he did have a fever, he had swollen lymph nodes, he actually had a swollen eyelid because the researcher introduced 
the parasitic material into the eye. Um, you know, four weeks later, six weeks later, there's still, um, you know, he was basic, the, he basically took this, uh, young man. And at that point there was not, um, the kind of testing that we have today for this parasite. So the ways that they would confirm that you actually were infected is that they would take laboratory raised kissing bugs and have them feed on the person and, and see if they pick up the parasitic material. So not only does he you know, purposefully infect this young man, but then also has these insects feeding on him to confirm. Um, and he did confirm it. And you know, I know you ran across these kind of horrific moments, but for me, it was horrific to also see this article still published online, you know, very accessible, um, with in the acknowledgments thanking the, the people who ran the psychiatric hospital and the doctors there for assisting him. And, you know, this article exists online, uh, you know, at this academic journal without any note of uh, recognition that it's a racist medical experiment that was carried out on a young a black patient. Um, I find that also really disturbing. You know, sometimes we have to go looking for it, but then there isn't necessarily acknowledgement from institutions about what they've published and what they're actually sharing as well. Yeah. And I, I worked at Stanford as a science writer and I was in the clinical trials group and I really came to appreciate the protections that patients have now. Uh, and it's because of experiments like Tuskegee and this that uh, they were developed. So. So what are the obstacles today in getting treated for Chagas in today's medical world? Yeah, so this disease, outside of that acute stage, we don't have a cure for it. Um, there isn't a cure. And so this gets a little complicated. There's There are two medications, benzmedazole and efertamox, which the FDA has finally approved for in the US, which is fantastic. And in the acute stage, they can be really successful. They can also be really uh, efficacious with young people, um, even outside of that acute stage. And researchers aren't sure why. They don't know if it's sort of the length of exposure to the parasite or if there's other factors. Um, but the reason that that matters is that in the United States, we do not screen babies for Chagas disease anywhere. And these are sort of state guidelines that govern this. Um, but even in places like Florida, where you have, uh, you know, a lot of women from South America, Central America and Mexico, um, it would be, uh, you know, it would be wise to screen women for this parasite because their babies are usually born again without showing uh, radical symptoms necessarily. So they're really easy to miss. The CDC, I think, has only identified at this point two, two babies that have been born with this disease that they that have been involved in the, in the treatment process. So if we were screening, we could actually catch these newborns and actually treat them with these medications and prevent them from becoming adults who have Chagas disease and have heart complications and might even need a heart transplant at some point in their lives. Um, so, but we don't, unfortunately, we don't do that. Um, in that chronic stage, the medications can be useful in terms of re reducing the parasite load, um, but there's a lot of complications that are, um, that are present. In fact, you know, the majority, I think I mentioned, right, like 300,000 people in the US, they're all immigrants and this population disproportionately are working in low wage jobs. It is a do not necessarily have insurance uh, or are relying on um, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, yeah. or Medicaid. And so it's not only getting access to the health care, but then also being able to take off from your job for multiple appointments. And then there's side effects to these medications, right? So you also have to be prepared not only to take the medication, but you might need to take time off work while you're on a two month or three month regimen. And so one doctor that I interviewed wow. said, you know, the biggest hurdle that his patients had was that they basically had to, um, they had to save up money so that if they needed to take time off work while they were receiving the treatment, they would still be able to pay for rent. They would still be able to pay, you know, put food on the table. So you have people who are just juggling so many things. And, and I'm only talking about the financial aspects. Um, you know, one of the families that I interviewed, um, the patient himself um, had a green card, had legal residency in the U.S. Um, but he was so worried and stressed out because he had family members who um, 
had temporary protection status that they were in danger of losing as policy was changing. So you have families and another family that I interviewed, her brother was undocumented uh, who had this disease. So families are just struggling with so many different hardships. Um, some of it is financial, some of it is citizenship, some of it is language barriers. Uh, one woman, her husband was a citizen. They're both, um, their first language was Spanish. And when they were calling doctor's offices, they just assumed that their, their English was too limited. And that's why the, the mm -hmm. receptionist was not understanding. Um, but no, most likely the receptionist had just never heard of Chavez disease and so didn't understand what they were seeking an appointment for. So you have language barriers. I had one patient I interviewed who she went online and she printed out everything she could find about Chagas disease and took it to her doctor, you know? Well, doctors love that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? And, and that also means that she had a lot of agency, right? Like she she had like, she, she was, was actually- empowered. Yeah. She was actually very empowered. She was a microbiologist in her own country. Um, she, she also did rely on her English dominant American husband to make phone calls for her as well to the doctor's office, right? So you're just having to negotiate with so many challenges, yeah, it's, it's quite it's quite an ordeal. So the latter half of your book, you do have a couple case studies of what, you know, the human aspects of what patients have to go through. And it's also been harder with COVID, I think, because you might have, you know, complaints and you, you for the last year, you haven't got, been able to go in and just for see your regular doctor, right? So. Absolutely, um, yeah. And COVID has been a hardship too, because, um, uh, you know, people, there, was, there were doctors who were going out into communities to do screenings for Chagas. Um, and so, of course, with COVID, a lot of that has been curtailed. Um, there is a Chagas clinic in Los Angeles County. Um, and of course, you know, they, they were limited, as was like every other part of the hospital during this past time. But um, but I would love to read from this section of the book. if this is yeah, the Your writing is so lovely. So I'd love to hear it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really... Um, I would love to share in particular one chapter about a patient named Carlos. When I first saw Carlos in his Maryland apartment, he reminded me of my uncle, Theo Papeles. Carlos had ironed his polo shirt like my Theo used to do, and he answered my questions with care, inflecting his words with a certain deference towards me as the journalist, la escritora, speaking overall in measured soft tones. He was the epitome of politeness, of being educado, as Theodora would have said. My auntie would have liked him. We sat by the window in the one-bedroom apartment that Carlos shared with his three brothers. The living room had three twin beds arranged to form a wraparound sofa. The beds were communal. The brothers, who all worked in construction, slept wherever they happened to collapse on any given day, except for Carlos. He had the bed in the living room behind the television, the one next to the electrical outlet. Dr. Marcus had connected me with Carlos, and as I sat next to him by the window and turned on the voice recorder, I felt acutely aware that it was my first time meeting a person who had lost his heart to the kissing bug disease. The parasite had decimated his left ventricle, and so his heart could not get adequate blood to the rest of his body. He was an end-stage heart failure, and he needed a heart transplant. Of course, to me, Carlos did not look like a man who was dying. He had black hair and a generous smile. The only unusual feature was that he sat in his own living room with a black messenger bag, its strap across his chest. He called the bag la máquina, the machine. It was his temporary heart. The Machina's official name is a left ventricular assist device, or LVAD, and it made it possible for Carlos to be alive. Inside the bag were batteries and a black box that looked like an external hard drive, a kind of mini computer whose wire entered the wall of his abdomen and connected to a pump near Carlos's heart. This pump did what his heart could no longer do. It sent blood continuously from his left ventricle to his aorta and to the rest of his body. To stay alive, Carlos had to have the LVAD connected to a power source at all times. Every two and a half hours, he said he changed out the batteries. When he was not hooked up to batteries, he connected the machina to an outlet, which was why he had the bed next to that electrical outlet, because at night he plugged in. 
When doctors first said that he needed the LVAD, his brother, Elias, cried in the hospital room. Don't worry, Carlos said to him. How are you going to live with that machine? His brother asked mournfully. Carlos had the same question, but he said, I'm going to live a long time because he did not want to see his brother so upset and because he did not want to die. The black machine in Carlos's hands made it possible for his heart to beat. And again, I thought of accordions, of the heart expanding and contracting, of a man forced to carry his heart in his hands. Hace un ruido, Carlos told me about the Elvad, referring to how loudly it screeches if it loses power. It had happened one night while he was sleeping. He must have tossed and turned too much and the machine unplugged from the outlet. The neighbors heard it upstairs, Carlos said. Another time, he told me, the machina howled and would not stop. His brothers rushed him to the hospital. Without the machine, his own heart could not keep him alive for very long. He did not know what the problem was, and later I saw that his medical documents referred to a left ventricular assist device complication. The first time that his heart bothered him, Carlos was 15. He didn't know that it was his heart. He only knew that he needed to cry and he wanted to be alone, which was strange for him. He had a big family. He loved being around his parents, his brothers, his sisters. They lived in a one room house in a rural area of Central America, a house made of paja or straw that gave them shade from the burning sun. His father farmed the fields and his mother, Mama Tila, tended the chickens and cleaned and prepared meals and raised the children. The Civil War had been underway for five years by then. The death squads and the murders of four Americans, including three nuns, were known. But that day when Carlos went to be alone by the river, he was not crying about the war. He had been a happy child, so he wondered why he was so sad all the time and why his heart would sometimes beat furiously inside his chest like a trapped bird. He did not want to tell his mother about his heart or his sadness. There were times when Mama Tila would talk to him, but he could not focus on what she was saying. She thought he was being disrespectful. His father noticed too. Carlos did not want to work in the fields. He wanted to lie down. His father talked to him, and when that didn't work, his father beat him. But that didn't work either. His brothers tried reasoning with him. Nothing helped. Carlos went to the river and cried. He thought, this must be adolescence. And then he started to fall. He was 19 and one day while out on a walk, he fell face down. His heart pounded inside his rib cage. What was happening to him? Where he lived in Central America, doctors were a luxury. He got to his feet and he moved on. Listening to Carlos, I remembered the familiar exhortation, listen to your heart. But no one points out that the heart speaks its own language, possesses its own syntax and vocabulary. Listen to your heart, but who teaches you that the heart cries an alarm by exhausting you, by taxing your lungs, by fatiguing you when you are only a teenage boy? And I'll stop there. Um, but I wanted to read that part in particular because, um, you know, it was shocking to me to to hear his experience as a child with this disease and how, of course, his family did not understand. Um, and, and his story really helped me to appreciate something that an Argentinian doctor had said, which is that he considers this disease to be a pediatric disease, that if only people were treated as children, they would not go on to need a heart transplant, you know, in their 40s, so, you know, later in their lives. Um, and I, have, I hadn't quite appreciated what that doctor said until I met him and others who had so clearly been infected as children at a time when if there was diagnosis happening, if there was treatment options available, they could have possibly been cured um, and not have to live their lives with this disease. Yeah, and what struck me is, and I've seen this a lot with congenital Lyme disease, that a kid is born sick and they don't know there's any other different state. You know, they, they just think, oh, everybody's this tired and uh, I'm just must be weak. It must be a character flaw. So, and, and then it reminds me of the problem with our current medical system, which since it's profit driven, it's incentivized uh, to treat disease and not prevent disease. Absolutely. 
yeah. unlike a national health system where you own the patient from cradle to grave like Denmark and it's in your best interest to catch a disease early. So that's. Yeah. And there was an amazing economist who actually looked at congenital chagas and looked at, mm -hmm. you know, you know, the cost involved in, in screening and treating mothers and children, as opposed to when, when they, when the children are now grown and also the, treating the mothers, um, later for um for complications and it's like 10 times cheaper to to yeah. screen and treat children than to wait until they need a you know an lvad or a heart transplant or you know ongoing medical care for mm -hmm. heart failure yeah well, i wanted to shift a little bit um because you teach writing at miami university in ohio right and uh, i think you're a big inspiration to latinx writers and uh feminist feminist writers and uh, bisexual writers. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to ask you, like, what advice would you give to young writers? Because it's, it's sort of a hard market to crack <laughs> right now. It's all COVID all the time and major media outlets are laying writers off. So what advice do you give your young students now? Oh, I have so much advice. <laughs> but, you know, I always tell my students, I teach in the creative writing program, and I do have to give a shout out to the University of Miami, where I got my MFA. I wish I was there in person at Books and Books um, to see folks. Um, but, yeah, I teach at Miami, the other Miami in Ohio. And, you know, what I tell students in creative writing is, um, you know, similarly in the way that I allowed this book to choose me and then I followed and, and followed for quite a number of years, actually. Five years, like you said. You, you took you Seven years, years, actually. No, in my case, it was more like seven years. Oh, you know, wow. not, not every single day, but pretty consistently for right. seven years. Um, and uh, but I tell students, you know, you have to. Um, you have to want it so bad, you know, it's not, it's not about, um, with the exception of maybe JK Rowling, you know, there is never going to be monetary compensation for the many, many hours that you put in. So you have to want it so badly because it's not just the lack of compensation eventually, but also, um, you're going to face so many obstacles. Like you're saying, you know, publishers, you know, I had publishers who said, well, you're not a doctor. It's like, yep, I'm not a doctor. Good point. <laughs> I knew that when I sent it to you, you know, because um, right. you're just going to face so many doors that, that close um, and you have to have that perseverance to keep knocking. Um, and so I always feel like for me, at least, I have to be so connected with with my purpose with every book. Like I have to believe in it so deeply because um, because there are going to be obstacles, you know, and, and some of them are going to be writing obstacles you know like i was really challenged with how to structure the book for example and the structure for the book didn't come until really late in my process mm -hmm. and then there's the like publishing obstacles that you're going to face so i feel like you have to like be so connected with with your purpose and your your desire to see it through um because yeah that's what's going to get you through the difficult moments um mm -hmm. for sure yeah writing with purpose i think and to me, what was driven was the injustice of the way the patients mm -hmm. were being treated. And Absolutely. and a doctor who's in the system wouldn't have time to write or wouldn't have the same outside view, objective view as someone who'd been through the disease. And that I think that's what I found too. Exactly. Yeah, it's a really different perspective. It's a really different perspective to be on the inside, to have to be a doctor caring for others than to be on the patient side, on the outsider, on the journal. And you know, there's sort of like a picture that you're able to see that I think is definitely harder from the inside. Mm -hmm. And I would say for myself, when I, I had a mentor who said, oh, you should try to publish this book. And they said, don't quit your day job. And I, I think it's sad that you can't make a living writing. Uh, it's hard to anyways, but uh, I think that was good advice. And yeah. I do too. I tell my students, you're going to do one of the two things. I've been around long enough to have seen it. So you're either going to have your day job or you're going to have your hustle. <laughs> and yeah. so your day job is exactly what you're talking about. I, and I, I always have to break it to my students. I have a day job too. I teach you that pays, you know, <laughs> that, that pays for, my, for me to have a home and for me to have food on the table. Um, or you're going to do the hustle, right? Where you're going to do different, essentially run your own business, right? You're going to do freelance gigs. You're going to do residencies. You're going to like, put together a work life that, that makes sense for you in some way. So yeah, that's, that's the, the reality side. I'm kind of curious though, how you wrote your book while working at Stanford. <laughs> like that is really, 
I don't know, an intense job situation on a day. I don't know. I'm just, this is me being curious. Like, were you writing at night? Were you researching on weekends? Were you taking vacation days? Like, how were you making it happen? Uh, so I, uh, Stanford wasn't too intense. I mean, I was working in a journalism job. So I had, what was great is I had access to the world's most amazing scientists like Stanley Falco, who invented or he he's the expert in pathogenesis of microbes or or Irv Weissman on stem cells. So that was super great. But I kept it on the down low because what I was saying in the book about Lyme disease is not accepted by mainstream medical, which I'm saying and I feel really confident that chronic Lyme persistent symptoms exist and there's political forces that are preventing that from being acknowledged. Uh, so that, that was hard. Uh, but then once I came out, I mean, Stanford was very open-minded about different opinions and I tried to make the book really science-based. Uh, so it, my, they actually wrote about my book. So that was very gracious. And, uh, even though it's not, it's sort of an inconvenient truth to, to think that the NIH was funding biological weapons research and I was funded by NIH. So. Uh, but luckily I wasn't in the tenure system. So I had freedom that someone getting NIH grants would not. Yeah. Yeah. It, in, you said inconvenient truth, but also well-documented in your book. So I, I think you, you mentioned that in the prologue of like the surprise of um, the resistance to something that is actually documented. Um, yeah. It's really yeah. And I think the last year and a half with the COVID and lab leak theory has made people more open to the possibility that our government might not be fully disclosing or uh, sort of sweep those human experiments under the rug. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I don't know if we have questions but if I, from the audience, but if we don't, I have more questions for you. We have a couple, let's see. We have, um, has the pandemic changed things as far as the medical system? Perhaps more attention on disease and focus on science? That's a great question. Um, you know, uh, I don't work in the medical system <laughs> necessarily. I'll be curious to hear what Chris has to say about this. I feel like from my perspective, uh, you know, I actually finished writing my book uh, just as the pandemic was declared. Um, and I ended up adding a section uh, about COVID, specifically about racial disparities. I think one of the things that really changed this past year is that more and more people are talking about racial disparities in healthcare than ever before. It was actually um, surprising to me how easy it was to transition in my book to a section about COVID because uh, I thought initially it was gonna feel like like a little awkward and it actually was a very seamless transition because I was writing about those racial disparities. Um, so, you know, everything from, you know, we saw early on people, it was easier to get tested for COVID if you lived in wealthier, whiter neighborhoods in different parts of the country. Uh, same thing with the vaccine, easier to get the vaccine if you lived in certain neighborhoods, had access to make your appointments online. A lot of that has changed and is changing. But I know in January, I was like, everybody else like a crazy person trying to get my parents an appointment because they don't have access to in the internet and um and so i think the awareness has really changed around racial disparities but i think it remains to be seen what that means in the long term because as chris was saying we do have a profit driven system and so so it's not patients first that are being considered um right it's, it's profit and bottom lines even Something that a lot of people don't know with Chagas disease is, um, you know, when you donate blood, the first time you donate blood, you get screened for Chagas disease. And there's actually a question on the forum about Chagas disease, but you don't get screened the second or the third time. And the, part of the reason that doesn't happen is that, uh, you know, they ran a cost benefit analysis and they found that it was not cost effective to screen you each time, that they weren't, they weren't turning up many positives. Um, but of course, you don't want to be in that situation, right, where um, you you are testing positive and you're not um, being screened in, in any way. Um, Chris, how about you? Do you think the pandemic has changed the medical system? Is there more of a... Uh, in a couple different, 
way is mostly positive. So I, being in the clinical tri trials group at Stanford, there was a preponderance of red tape to get a vaccine trial through. So in the past, the fastest vaccine to ever get through the gauntlet was seven years. And then here we got uh, a vaccine through in a year at reasonably safe. And so to me, I think we've forged some new pathways to, to move faster because really in a way the academic research grant process is it's built on five-year grants. And so our researchers take that full five, they try to get as many grants as they can. It's just inherent slowness. Also academic researchers in medicine are very competitive. They're all trying to get the very few R01 research grants from the NIH. Uh, they're secretive about their findings. If they're gonna do a vaccine or a test kit, they wanna uh, keep their findings secret because they might wanna commercialize it. I just thought it was heartwarming how all the scientists rally, pretty much every scientist was <laughs> in the medical research world was thinking about COVID or actually doing it. It was to the detriment of tick-borne diseases and probably Chagas, but uh, it showed that we could work together, mission to Mars, uh, kind of rallying. So I, I like I like that a lot. Yeah, you're reminding me there was um, a doctor who wrote in Nature magazine of like, what, like if only we could do this for malaria, for example, you know, or for so many of these diseases that disproportionately affect poor people around the world, that kind of like, we're all in this together, we're on a mission. Um, but, but we have it's to the human it. race. It's the human race. Yeah, it's exactly. About your university and my university. Yeah, exactly. We haven't found a way to bring that political will, right, to these other diseases. Um, yeah, thank you. So there's a question here for Daisy. Can you talk a little about the research that you did on the book? Oh, that's a big question. Let's see the, the short, <laughs> the shorter answer. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I started from the beginning when it was discovered in 1909. So I was looking a lot at um, Dr. Carlos Chagas, for whom the disease is named, a uh, really famous Brazilian physician scientist. Um, so did a deep dive into that. Ended up, as I talked about, finding out about that medical experiment. So that was looking into um, that particular researcher's correspondence and sort of the archives of like his, uh, not only his correspondence, but also reports that he kept, et cetera. Um, and then there was like research into um, the FDA's process of approving these drugs in the United States and pharmaceutical executives who wanted to get involved because there was a potential profit to be made um, by with a special federal program that would benefit companies that were paying attention to neglected diseases in some ways. Um, so the research was me reading I, I just count I, at the beginning I thought I would keep track and I did not manage to keep track of all the articles that I read um, both in terms of medicine in terms of science I am terrified of insects I was terrified of insects I guess I can't say that anymore since I wrote a book called the kissing bug but I am not you know a huge fan of the insect world and um, so I had quite a process and quite a journey of reading science articles where I was trying to like get, I, I've said, told this to other people, but like trying to get the images off of my computer screen, but still read the article. Like I said, I wanted to read the text, but not look at pictures or drawings of the bug. Um, and then in the process of, uh, of doing that, I became, um, you know, de more desensitized and more just, I don't know if enamored is the right word, but like really kind of strangely fascinated by these, um, by these insects and their, um, yeah, I don't know perseverance uh I, I don't chris how do you feel about it <laughs> like no, i don't I mean, know one, one, right word, but. One, one thing that strikes me about chagas is what a complicated life cycle it has it doesn't transmit it through the you know the bite it's they poop your skin is broken or or you get it in your eyes or your nose or your mouth uh so that uh, that's really complicated. And I just did a deep dive article about cat scratch fever that's going to be out on Vox. And mm -hmm. it's the same kind of transmission. Fleas and ticks carry it and they bite your cat. And then the organism lives happily in a cat. The cat's happy. And then your cat scratches you or bites you and you get it that way. And it's like, 
I, I'm just always in wonderment of nature, how they find their little niche and, uh, and we're just humans. We're just collateral damage. <laughs> Do we need to be scared of our cats? I ask as a beloved cat owner. Oh, you probably shouldn't read my article when it comes. <laughs> So one thing that happens with a lot of research is you look at the world very differently, right? It's like Yeah, if you're a hypochondriac, this is not <laughs> a good field to go into. <laughs> well said. <laughs> okay, we will be looking for that article. <laughs> okay. yeah. um, we will. <laughs> <laughs> has um has the pen no this is sorry i'm rereading the same question um so what is next for you uh daisy um and has what am i reading okay have you become more of an activist in the field since writing this book and what's next for you sorry about that i have such a complicated relationship with the word activist i never called myself an activist uh i didn't for a long time i still did it's not my go-to term um, only because, uh, I don't know, I feel like, I, I don't know, I'm doing what's right. I, I don't know if that's, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, if that's necessarily activism, I feel like advocating, um, and speaking up about a situation that's unjust, speaking up about a disease that disproportionately affects marginalized communities in the U S um, and in Latin America. I don't know. It feels like the right thing to do. Like, and it feels, sometimes I feel a little strange saying I am an activist uh, because I'm speaking out and writing about it. Um, but I am, I am, I just have a complicated relationship with that term, which helps me to answer the other question, which is that I'm working on a collection of essays. Um, and I think activist is probably one of the subjects of one of those essays that I need to write. But I also did have a lot of material that did not go into this book um, because I wanted to approach it in a different way and with a different tone. And, and, um, and so that's also gonna go into some of those essays particularly around citizenship and access to healthcare, I became really fascinated by the kind of linkage that we developed as a country, um, you know, and not just in the last couple of decades where we link citizenship, having citizenship to having healthcare access. Um, so I got really interested in the, in the beginning of the United States and how we, how we decided, you know, back in the day, whether someone could see a doctor in a small town in Massachusetts, for example. So, so there's an essay on that. So there, yeah, there's a couple of pieces that did not, um, were not the right place in this book. And so have become for, have become sort of material for that book. And so much food for thought. Oh my God. What a great conversation. How interesting. I've been taking notes. I wanted like read more, find out more. Uh, but thank you for spending all that time and producing this wonderful book. And same with you, Chris, for Bitten. You know, we've sold it a lot at the store. Um, so thank you for your work. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your support of indie bookstores. I want to remind everyone watching that you can order The Kissing Bug from Books and Books. We'll ship it right out to you. But if you're in Miami and you want to come by one of our stores and grab a copy, you can do that too. And um, I just, I look forward, you know, to the essays, to reading more. And um, is there any way that, that we can do anything else to like help as people, as citizens in the world? Yeah, well, for Chagas disease, you can definitely spread the word um, because the more a lot of doctors still don't know about it, don't know about just the existence of the disease. Um, and even in the Latinx community, a lot of people still don't know about it. So I think getting the word out um, about this disease, um, there's a group called, I don't know if I, if I can put it in chat, but La Socha, L-A-S-O. -S -S I, can, I can open the chat if you want. Okay, yeah, I can put in. Um, there you go. Yeah, let me pull up their um, web page. But this is um, a uh, patient advocacy organization. Okay, great. And, uh, put it in there. There we go. Um, there you go. Okay. Look them up um, and definitely support their efforts as well. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, and then I'm putting um, a great patient site for Lyme disease or tick-borne diseases in general. So LymeDisease.org. Everything you. you ever want to know, a symptom checklist, uh, how to get insurance coverage, etc. Thanks so much. That's wonderful. And Chris, we can follow you on Twitter for the cat story. 
Okay. Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing about a 14 year old boy who all of a sudden sinks into sudden psychosis and the medical system wants to lock him away. And then just a couple of courageous uh, doctors find out he has cat scratch fever. So it's an amazing story with a happy ending. Good. The, the feeling that I get from both of you is just incredibly hopeful uh, because when you start, when you read that excerpt, I thought I was going to start crying. It was so sorrowful, you know, and so real. Uh, but I feel like you are a person that's like filled with hope um, about things. So Absolutely. again, thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks for the invitation. It's been a great way to spend an hour. I learned a lot, Daisy. So thanks. Thank you from you. Thank you, Chris. Big fan of your book. <laughs> thank right. you, everyone.